Welcome to Sam Conversation, a program of South Asia Monitor. I'm Colonel Anil Bhatt, and it's my pleasure to have with us Mr. Jaydev Ranade, former Additional Secretary, Cabinet Secretariat, and President of the Center for China Analysis and Strategy. And we have Lieutenant General Khonsam Himalay Singh, retired, highly decorated, retired as a commandant of the infantry school, but had four very, very eventful postings on the line of actual control against China. And we have Dr. Jaydeep Shaikya, a prolific writer and a specialist in terrorism and security affairs based at Guwahati. I, to begin the narrative, I must go back to 2019 December. It was on 30th December 2019 that Dr. Lee Wenliang from Wuhan, from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, who made an announcement about the, vi the virus. Very swiftly, he was punished by the establishment for spreading rumors. Uh, that was by early January, he was, and um, he incidentally died of COVID, but not much later, almost everyone in the Wuhan Institute of Virology disappeared. Wuhan has <coughs> a seafood market, or the wet market as they call it. It sells a whole lot of animals, not just seafood many animals. Uh, the first 41 cases of unusual pneumonia uh, that were encountered in uh, Wuhan, um, 14 were not related to seafood. 14 turned out to be related to bats. And this is what uh, Dr. Shi Zhengli. Dr. Shi Zhengli, she is known for her research on bats. In fact, um, also referred to as the bat woman uh, by some writers. Uh, she too went through contortions, you know, in conveying what is happening, what is not happening. In any case, bats are not sold in the seafood market. Now, of course, the Chinese Communist Party's, um, you know, propaganda machinery went into overdrive. They made sure nothing of this got known. And uh, in fact, Wall Street Journal and Washington Post, the correspondents of both these newspapers were expelled in early January. Now, uh, Dr. Francis Boyle of the US, who drafted the Biological Weapons Act of 1989, issued a detailed statement that the 2019 Wuhan coronavirus is a Chinese offensive biological warfare weapon. Now, let's take our you know, thoughts back to 2020, a look at the line of actual control. Whatever PLA did from May 
May onwards, fifth May, ninth May, was part of a, you can say, a proper organized Chinese aggression. And this could not have been planned overnight. The planning of this must have gone to, you know, many months before, or a year or more. The incursions were not only in, you know, Depsang or uh, the Bangong So, they also uh, went to the uh, Mansarovar and some other areas which have not been much reported, not been much read on. Without delving any further, I will now uh, hand you over to Dr. Jaydeep Saikia, who uh, I would like him to comment on um, in view of the many meetings that he's had uh, with uh, uh, many meetings he's attended, including some track two. Um, where are we from there? Jaydeep. Uh, first of all, thank you, Kamabad, sir, and uh, giving me this opportunity to, to be in, in such illustrious company this uh, afternoon. Well, uh, I do agree with you that, uh, and I'm not disputing the fact that there could be a, a obvious Chinese game plan in the biological uh, sphere. We're talking about the biological aspect, which sort of uh, emanated from Wuhan. And also, of course, the uh, Galwan uh, incident. But we must sort of, you know, uh, try and crystal gaze as to what the Chinese game plan could be a decade from now, that would be more uh, uh, sort of, you know, educative as far as I'm concerned. So briefly, I think we should look at uh, 10 years from now. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I would look at 2027 when the People's Liberation Army of China would uh, complete its 100 year. As a matter of the CPC, the Chinese uh, Communist Party of China is uh, completing its 100 year this year in July. So uh, the, the, the uncrowned king of China, Xi Jinping, is to be actually would be coronated in this uh, particular year, later this year, July. So uh, I think uh, three important aspects which we must bear in mind when we talk about uh, the game plan which China might be embarking upon or thinking of embarking upon is, of course, the economy, military, and of course, its uh, ambition to uh, 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 harboring, is a harboring of ambition to become a global leader. Even as we talk about belligerence, and that is the flavor of the time at this point of time that we are talking about belligerence and how uh, the dragon is sort of, you know, fuming and sort of, you know, with fire and brimstone. We must also see that, you see, with great power comes great responsibility. And uh, this is an old adage that all of us we uh, are, 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 are aware of. And I'm certain that even the Chinese mind, I have visited China in 2002. And as you said, I have been part of the Chinese uh, dialogue with China. And uh, this gives me to think that it's possible that there could be scenarios other than the one which we keep talking about at uh, this point of time, especially after uh, Doklam and Galwan happened. The scenario which I'm talking about very quickly, sir, could be that you know in the quest for leadership to oust the United States from uh, the world leadership, there could be a show of magnanimity, even-handedness, and even charity. I'm just going to quickly sort of give you one example: the way it solved its border problem with Tajikistan, for instance. Twenty-eight thousand square kilometers in the Pamirs were given away by the People's Republic to Tajikistan, and Dushanbe thought that it was a uh, great diplomatic victory for uh, Tajikistan. So I'm not saying that that, could be, that can be replicated in the case of India and China. And even as we continue to exercise caution, and I, and I think we, uh, the word I would, the phrase I would use is uh, keep the saber unsheathed and exercise caution, particularly in the borders. I think we must also, as academicians, uh, at this point of time, in this discourse at least, uh, talk about various scenarios and one possible scenario which i am putting forward to you sir in all my humility is that in the quest for leadership china could also 
behave a little more rationally in the future, sir? Well, um, thank you. Um, Jyoti Paul, I can say, in, as they say in uh, Hindi, Tumare Mume Ghi Shakkar. But I, I'm sorry if I sound skeptical, but I don't see any. No, as, as scholars, we must, we must, you know, never, never um, stop our pursuit of, you know, putting forward um, uh, formulas for peace, uh, you know, whatever we can. But with the Chinese Communist Party, I'm sorry to say, I was a sixth class student when the 1962 Chinese aggression happened. I had, it, you know, my, uh, I had friends and family who were in the army and uh, uh, we, 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 we've studied, a lot of us have been students of China from since, since that time. And uh, I don't see anything, I think for seven decades since independence, we've only been ve not just reasonable, we've been more than reasonable, we've been, uh, we have been uh, allowing ourselves to be browbeaten, to be, you know, um, it's, it's not um, a term, um, dragon, dragoon, gundas, gundaism. Uh, Dadagiri. <laughs> That's what we, we've, uh, you know, we've uh, uh, been accepting, uh, except till last year. Oh, anyway, I'm sure there is, there is much that Mr. Jayadev Ranade will have to, uh, you know, educate us with. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Anand, and. Uh... <clears throat> Like Jaydeep, uh, let me just say <clears throat> how uh, happy I am to be here uh, on such an informed and uh, illustrious panel to discuss a subject which I think exercises most Indian minds today. And if it doesn't, it should. Uh, it's something that for us, I think, is an enduring problem and it touches on multiple fronts. I uh, would just like to spell out a couple of uh, pointers. I'm aware that we don't have much time, but as to on the point that you mentioned about the planning for the present uh, confrontation. To my mind, and as you know, I have been following China fairly closely for quite some time. To my mind, this planning started years ago. It was not perhaps originally with the intention of teach, giving us or administering to us a punitive lesson, but it certainly was to extend China's diplomatic, military and economic power well across its frontiers and towards the West. In fact, the Belt and Road Initiative was or is a clear example of how China intends to become a global power. In case there was any misunderstanding about this, I think Xi Jinping, uh, perhaps because of overconfidence, that is what some of his, as they say, comrades in the Chinese Communist Party have privately confided in me, uh, confided in me over the years. Because of overconfidence, at the 18th Party Congress in 2012, and then the 19th Party Congress in 2017, he actually set out a timetable for where China will be in which year. Uh, Mr. Saikia alluded to the 100th year of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party, which is this July. He announced the China dream in at the 18th Party Congress, which envelops, of course, this by and he laid down the timetable for its achievement as 2021. And what does the China China dream comprise? It comprises three things. First, 
making the Chinese people prosperous. And as you know, he claimed to have eliminated poverty in China at the end of last year. If you read the Chinese newspapers, of course, they still differ. There are various pockets which still exist. To make the Chinese nation strong, and the third, which is the devil in the detail, to achieve the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation. This is where the standard Chinese formula, which they keep coming out with, recovery of territories lost through the imposition of unequal treaties by hostile foreign powers is contained. In other words, territories that they feel belong to them, it's another matter that all of us here may contest them because they go back centuries, at least three dynasties back. But that is the maximum extent to the Chinese empire and they want to have it. So that was 2021. Now they're not going to achieve that because they have not yet completed it. But at the 19th party Congress, he repeated that and he also added two other things. By 2025, he wanted to make China join the ranks of the most technologically advanced countries. And by 2049, which is the 100th year of the founding of the People's Republic of China, he wanted China to become a major power with global pioneering influence. That phrase is important because by saying that, he said China should have the right and the influence to set up or to mold international organizations something which only the United States can do at present. So in other words, he put the US on notice, which is why with, within two, three months, you notice Trump began imposing restrictions on the Chinese and began crippling them. But let's come to us. By operationalizing the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor in April 2015, he caught us off guard when he went to Islamabad and announced it. He has actually put Chinese investment in territories occupied by Pakistan and which belong to us. Till that date, China had maintained ambiguity on the status of POK, Aksai Chin, apart from, of course, the fact that they have it, but they hadn't commented officially, uh, Gilgit, Baltistan. But by putting $62 billion into this China-Pakistan economic corridor and operationalizing it, they actually uh, justified or backed Pakistan's claim. That is where, in fact, our problem started. And I think, if I may say so, we missed the impact. We missed the implication. Because along with that, if you recall, and I'm sure at least you and uh, General Himalaya would re remember, he began the restructuring and reorganization of the People's Liberation Army. And in 2016, which is a year later, he established the Western Theater Command, which is the one that we have confronted with. It is the largest theater command in China, accounting for half China's land area and the maximum military strength of the country. That is what we are up against. And if you look at the tasking of the uh, Western Theatre Command. I won't go into it in detail, but let me just mention that their tasking includes the protection of Chinese assets and the CPEC. In other words, they, with that establishment of that Western Theatre Command, they have prepared the ground for either taking care of us, and I, you know the context I'm saying it in, in case the CPEC is being uh, derailed, or coming to Pakistan's protection to safeguard their assets in the China-Pakistan economic corridor. What we are seeing here, um, this massing of troops, is linked with that. Because after April 2015, the Chinese began saying at the highest official level, that means to our prime minister, to other visitors, at track two, or track one and a half, track two, and academics and think tanks saying, ease tensions with Pakistan, resume talks with Pakistan, resolve Kashmir, and then look to improve relations with China. 
obviously that was not happening in fact uh, prime minister modi revved up the engines a bit more when he took up the issue of terrorism and began trying to indict pakistan on that and then the failure of the two summits at wuhan and and mamlapuram mm -hmm. uh, i'm not saying this with the benefit of hindsight i've written that so i've committed my views on paper but the fact is that the relations were deteriorating steadily the chinese saw us as a rival which was unbending and that upsets their what i may call two centenaries goal first centenary being china dream the second being to become a global power with pioneering influence in order to achieve that they have to be the unrivaled power in asia and for that we are an obstacle so we have to be humbled uh, that is the chinese aim and ambition personally i don't think they are going to succeed and certainly it will not be easy but which is why i said it will be an enduring problem for us till one of the two of us get sorted out i'll stop thank there you. come back uh, later thank you jayadev with very very um, uh, you know pertinent points you put and uh, when you you know say when you mention the uh, wuhan and mamlapuram summits now the irony is that with what they did on 5th of may onwards 5th of may and 9th of may was you know only using crude weapons and causing injuries from 1967 when we had the uh, skirmishes in sikkim nathula and chola it is after those when they lost pla lost about 400 almost uh, soldiers convoy full of vehicles and many hundred bunkers that is when they began pressing for let no let us not use force of firearms against each other let us uh, you know resolve any of our differences by dialogue only and they in one way very again ironically they maintain that bulletlessness they killed four assam rifles uh, riflemen at tulungla arunachal pradesh on 20th october 1975 but not by bullets by torture on 5th may 9th may they used these crude weapons causing only injuries on 15 june they killed with those crude weapons they killed 20 indian army soldiers including one colonel who commanded the 16 battalion the bihar regiment and then within a barely a couple of hours the repost that they faced they will never forget officially they may have lost 43 or 45 but there are us <laughs> reports of other other reports which take the score to up to over 100 we not we won't go into that but by doing all these they have neutralized every single agreement of peace and tranquility and every single summit they all stand you know shattered now coming to what is happening on the ground i think no no one better than uh, left general konsam mal singh to give us an idea of you know the kind of preparation that may have gone into what they've done what they wanted to do and what they could not because that what what happened are uh, you can say counter action on 16 june uh, 2020 certainly put the brakes on uh, their further plans over to general singh Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Bhatsa, and uh, I'm delighted to be uh, part of this discussion in, um, along with uh, Mr. Rana Day and Mr. Jaydeep Saikia. Thank you very much. Uh, coming straight to your question about uh, what could be uh, happening now, uh, as you know, that uh, May is the time for another about five to six months normally. Uh, in the PLA and Indian Army, we have what we normally uh, know as summer deployment, 
and uh, we carry out certain reconnaissance, surveillance, and uh, also certain deployments. That has been the case for many, many years, but the situation now is uh, slightly different in the light of what happened last year. Many things have changed in the geopolitics as well as even in, uh, in the security scenario of uh, uh, in the Indochina security scenario. So I would, uh, I mean, uh, what, what uh, uh, Chinese army PLA would be doing at this stage is that you already have uh, reports of you know, two motorized divisions in, uh, in that area of uh, Aksai Chin and uh, between their claim lines very close to uh, what happened last year. Uh, they are on a summer deployment and an exercise. So two motorized divisions is a huge uh, force in that area to begin with. Uh, similarly, we have a mirror deployment uh, of ours. We also have close to, you know, many 50 to 60,000 troops in that area. So uh, this is a routine as far as, uh, you know, the summer months are concerned. What is not routine is the intention, is the intention. Uh, and the Chinese uh, PLA, or for that matter, China is a country being opaque. And uh, we, our intelligence system, uh, need to be much more advanced, you know, enhanced. Our surveillance systems through various satellite means and uh, other uh, cyber means need to be enhanced because ground, uh, ground intelligence is very, very restricted, you know. Um, uh, so therefore, we need a very, very you know, sophisticated intelligence and surveillance system right now. And uh, as the kinetics part, you know, in a uh, conventional deployment, force to force and mirror deployment, all, all is okay. And I'm very confident that uh, in that domain, uh, we, the Indian Army has a huge advantage in many areas. You know, survivability in the high altitude area is the first battle won. Next comes the, you know, uh, the opponent. And the Chinese army, having seen them in many uh, meetings and uh, other interactions, I have, uh, I have no doubt in my mind that our Indian army soldiers um, are far, far superior. But what, is, what may not be superior is the technological advantage. I am not very sure about uh, other domains like you know artificial intelligence, for example, the cyber, because the kinetics part, I'm very confident this will be taken care of. Our air force and our you know uh, the military, the infantry, and other all arms that is uh, deployed there is quite capable in a localized affair. As I said earlier, in an unrestricted kind of, which I don't think Chinese will really attempt, as Jadif Saike also brought it out, that um, they may not go into a complete all-out uh, kind of a uh, skirmish with uh, India, but the localized border in, in either intended with a surgical aim or even unintended consequences like Galwan could happen. That is what we have to be prepared for, sir. So, this is uh, what I can share with you. This is uh, generally what I feel that should could be happening at this stage. But the last point that I'd like to add uh, to your this thing is that uh, the, our logistics uh, capability, the survivability, you know, survival uh, means to survive there. Uh, the Chinese PLA's survival um, I think uh, uh, is uh, questionable in the sense that though they have far better, uh, far better equipment and other things, but they may not have the will to survive there. You know, in a in a uh, in a situation of that kind. So that is where our soldiers are. Uh, I believe are far superior. So I think we are quite confident as far as the kinetic part is concerned. But the other domains we need to be watch watchful of. Um. General Himala, you have very, very correctly brought out, you know, the aspects of China's uh, fighting capability, its soldiers' fighting capability vis-a-vis -vis its equipment. We, I've um, written um, and, uh, you know, stressed on this point very often that a lot of Chinese PLA is about psychological warfare. Part of that psychological warfare is show yourselves 
as very powerful. You know, they're great at visuals of, very impressive visuals of large numbers of um, mechanized forces, uh, you know, in exercises, parades. But we've seen the fighting cap capability of the, uh, there's um, um, from in 62, it's not the Indian soldiers fighting capability that was in, you know, wanting. It was the, we were fighting with an ancient rifle. We have to thank the Chinese now that we got a new rifle for 19, before 1965, the 7.62 self-loading rifle. Even that is changed now. Anyway, but uh, it, it is, it, it, there, was, there, was, there was no comparison between the, the, the kind of valor, you know, of uh, Indian troops and uh, Chinese. And come again now, it was, we, 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 saw, we saw it, uh, you know, again on um, um, uh, 15 June, 15, 16 June, when one, you know, uh, Gurmet Singh single-handedly threw down 14 of them in, in the uh, freezing Galwan, uh, Galwan River. And some others who went without arms deprived the Chinese soldiers of their crude arms and used them against them. And this is just, I mean, I mean, and let's not take that for granted. Let's not, you know, but we must, there's no doubt about, you know, what we need to do. We've got, we've, the lessons that we have learned about their, um, uh, that whatever has happened, it is that that we must be guarding against. Jaydeep, I will now come back to you again now in view of uh, what we should do, you know, our, our um, topic is what is China's game plan and is India prepared? I ask you now again, what are the aspects, the, at least the psychological aspects that we, ne we need to prepare? Well, I think what you said towards the end of your, uh, what you just said just now is very important, the psychological aspect. We in the Northeast particularly are experiencing a second coming of the Chinese hand, as it were, you know, the way they, uh, you, all of you have heard about the 1967 uh, long march, as it were, by the NSC and by the Naga rebels, all the way to Yunnan, when the, the president yes. secretary yes. of the NSC and I am, Uiba himself, with Brigitte Tinoseli, walked through Myanmar and went to Yunnan. Uh, Nirmal Libedon has uh, very nicely documented that. For a while, during Tang Chiyoping's time, uh, this had stopped. But according to ground reports which I received and open source material, I believe that they have restarted this game all, all over again. For instance, the Alpha Independent, which is anti-talk, uh, headed by Parish Barua. Parish Barua. Uh, he is sitting in Yunnan, even as, I, even as we speak. And uh, about a year or a year and a half ago, the chairman of uh, the Ulfa Independent, Obijit Ohom, who resides in the United Kingdom, actually uh, behaved as if he was a public relations manager of the, uh, of the People's Republic of China or the Chinese <laughs> intelligence. Uh, he made statements about uh, Dalai Lama, His Holiness, visiting Arunachal Pradesh and, you know, uh, senior dignitaries of the Indian government going to, and he had no business because the, as I understand, as a student of insurgency of the office, I thought that they were interested in the sovereign Assam, but they have now actually totally doing the total bidding of the Chinese intelligence, the Ministry of State Security, as it were. And um, even if the new government, which has come into power in Assam, have sent feelers for talks to Paraj Barua, in fact, uh, he has declared a unilateral ceasefire quoting uh, COVID-19, but the uh, fact of the matter is, this is my considered opinion that it will be very difficult for him personally to come back because uh, these Chinese minders will not allow him to do so. So Alpha and uh, even the PLA of Manipur, uh, headed by, uh, uh, well, de facto headed by uh, Commander-in-Chief Manohar Mayom, these two people are uh, very, very close to the Chinese uh, intelligence yes, agencies. Yes. Uh, yes. primarily the Ministry of State Security. So when, when you look at these aspects, which is a little different from what General Himalaya Singh talked about, uh, their preparedness as far as, you know, uh, the, 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 the army is concerned, 
but they are trying to open up other fronts, including the psychological warfare front. So they, we will witness a proxy war as far as Northeast is concerned, and they will continue. No, no, you are very, I'm very sure that between um, where you are in Guwahati, both Assam yes. and Manipur, and uh, Manipur means Manipur and Nagaland, they, you cannot, the, you cannot, you know, the Chinese, the kind of desperation that they are in now, they are bound to, you know, uh, reignite or reconnect you know, the, their connections with the, uh, with the Paresh Barwa, of course, uh, uh, the Ulfa, so-called independent Ulfa, of course, but also the uh, Maithi groups and the, and the Nagas, the, the NSCN. NSCN, as it is, you know, uh, Dwingling Muiva often makes sounds of, uh, and NSCN stands for national Socialist Council of Nagaland, but it often is, you know, referred to as National Socialist Council of Nagalim. Nagalim means Naga in, in, in inhabited areas of all states, which is a very, very, very sensitive issue. It can draw, you know, too much of blood if you even talk about it. Yes, sir. Anyway, but they, we have to keep a very sharp eye out for that. Now, now, uh, Mr. Jaydev Branade, I will, I, I'll request you to, to throw some light on, you know, the, uh, when we um, disengage from, um, the, and it's only one stage of disengagement that has happened, you know, the Pangong So we've disengaged from the Kailash range, which I think a whole lot of us soldiers uh, and um, analysts Feel we should never have done. However, that's happened. From Depsang, I don't think they're going to move. Depsang, Gogra, and uh, um, that, that area, uh, I don't think they're going to move. Um, I invite your uh, comments, re recommendations on this, uh, you know, for, for, for the government. Um, Anil, uh, permit me to make Two quick points before I address your uh, specific question. The first, I'd like to just uh, uh, <clears throat> reinforce what uh, Mr. Saikya said uh, the, about the contacts between the Northeast insurgent groups and the Chinese. The Chinese have had an intelligence post at Kunming, which is the capital of Yunnan, for years. So that contact never stopped, but it was, you know, it was a very low level contact. Uh, occasionally, military supplies were given, cash was exchanged, but not much more. The scale of that has probably gone up according to reports that I read. <coughs> I will <coughs> refer to what Mr. Saikya says. He's on the ground there and he would know. So that certainly is one apart. But let me look at what is the public domain or more open public domain. The threats that the Chinese have been giving since 2017, Dokla where they have specifically said that we will stoke the insurgency or we'll mount the insurgency in the Northeast. We will create trouble in Sikkim and get it to split. We will mount an international campaign to disrupt your close ties with Bhutan. And we will send troops into Kashmir like you have done at Dokla and we'll split it. So I'm just putting that on record. Those threats have been made, which brings me to my second point. You referred to the Sai War and how the Chinese would be doing that. I would just like to add a note of caution on that. Certainly, they will play Sai War. They're very good. Uh, communists usually are very good at deception, at camouflage, and at concealment. The Chinese are excellent in that. They will certainly try that. But this, the environment has changed. Xi Jinping also has to show to his own domestic audience and in his quest for becoming a global power, that he's able to, quote unquote, vanquish another competing power, which leaves him with three choices, India, Vietnam, or Japan. So it's his people. It may be, as General Himalaya Singh said, not a pitched all-out war or a conventional all-out war. It can be a small uh, chunk of territory, but if you ask me, 
and I have again gone on record on that, uh, including at two Air Force commanders' conferences, in fact, where I cautioned them that 2020 will be when the showdown will happen. And I said that in 2017 and 2018. And I said it doesn't have to be an all-out war. Let us say, for example, hypothetically, they decide that let's make a grab for Tawar. And when they lull us into believing that situation is now normalized, they do a quick pounce, then what happens? So I think we have to be prepared for that kind of situation or even at a smaller scale somewhere. But coming to your point about, and, and that brings me to the other point about their united front activities. You know, that's below the radar. And I would suggest we all look at it. The way they have been operating in India, lavishing cash, uh, inducements for trips to China, etc. They bought over journalists. Uh, Mr. Saikia, since you're in this show, certainly not you, but uh, they bought over journalists, media houses, and we can see the ads coming in the uh, newspapers, etc. It's not done uh, gratis or at normal advertisement rates. Uh, intellectuals, etc. They they're trying to suborn a free society. So that is again what the Chinese Communist Party calls their magic weapon. So all these things will happen. But uh, uh, to come to your specific point, how do I see things panning out? What is going to happen? Uh, I don't think that, as I said, these talks that are going on at the border, I think they will drag on. Uh, it suits both sides, but there will be no further disengagement. That was just a little limited baby step. That was it. Uh, Wang Yi has already made a statement. In fact, on 15th of June, when Galwan happened, if you recall that night, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi and the Western Theatre Command spokesman both mm -hmm. said that Ladakh is China's. So they have uh, made very clear uh, what their position is. On Depsang, again, I don't see any uh, uh, yielding by the Chinese. In fact, if I may just uh, mention, at the 14th five-year plan, which was approved on the 11th of March this year, they have approved 20 multi-purpose border airports they have decided to extend and upgrade three national highways, including 219, to get the other two also to run along the, uh, the India-China uh, border or India-Tibet border. They are building the, a huge dam on the great bend of the Brahmaputra or the Yarlung Sangpo, which they can quite well use as a lever to uh, inflict damage on us. But in any case, there will be problems. So they're doing all this. They're building railroads, a new railroad, which will shorten the time, travel time by 10 hours from Chengdu to Lhasa. And again, rail links to two separate provinces coming out of Shigatse. So in other words, they're beefing up their infrastructure. And uh, to my mind, that doesn't mean that uh, they're looking for peace of a goodwill. They, what they're trying to do is put the pressure on us so that we come around to their accepting their point of view. The final point uh, that I would like to make is uh, specific to, I would say, the Northeast, are uh, the two articles that I saw in May this year, uh, just a few days ago, in fact, on the PLA websites, where they have pointed to, firstly, the importance of the new road that they have built in Medoc, which is across Arunachal, and secondly, apart from having criticized Mao earlier for withdrawing from Arunachal, they have again listed the benefits of taking over Arunachal, which is under the illegal occupation of India. That right. may be Saiwar, as you said, quite possible. But the question that comes is, can we afford to take that as Saiwar, or do we have to uh, prepare for anything there, thereby straining our already limited resources? So uh, that is the situation uh, that exists. It's not very heartening, but that's how I see it. I see a long drawn, long drawn uh, contention between both of us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, General Himalaya Singh, um, is very um, pertinent points that, uh, again, Mr. Narendra has brought out. Now, uh, how do you think uh, um, we, there is no doubt about the fact that there was tremendous progress made in 2020. 
the, you know, this, it, this massive um, move of occupying um, the Kailash range is a master stroke. It's a master stroke, but what um, involved a very, very major, um, you know, strategic operation of, uh, you know, getting across men and stores, equipment, weaponry, 24 by 7. The wheels were running of all kinds of vehicles. Uh, with the kind of force levels that we have or intended, how do you see it, you know, uh, playing out? Sir, so, uh, at the outset, I'd like to uh, uh, completely, you know, just go back a little. And uh, I agree with what uh, Mr. Ranade has uh, given uh, in, uh, he's summed up by saying that all these activities that Chinese are doing is like a pushback to India's rise. They will not allow India to rise. I mean, that sums it all. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, he's uh, explained in a brilliant manner why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, I'll just add one point about the Northeast insurgents. Um, uh, they have the capacity to, uh, when I say they, the Chinese have the capacity to actually uh, add fuel to the fire. Uh, but the ground situation today is, I don't think the, there is much of a popular support or the ground support uh, for uh, militancy, though they exist uh, in various pockets, which have now turned into some kind of a uh, ethnic war, uh, if, if I may say so. So, uh, therefore, how much they will, but they definitely have the capacity to uh, add fuel to the fire as one of the means, you know, to uh, restrain uh, our uh, India's uh, rise. That is one point. And coming to your uh, uh, question about um, uh, the, uh, about the, the Skylast range, uh, whatever was decided, uh, those people on ground, the decision makers, they know it best. But um, knowing that uh, having uh, served in those areas, um, I would uh, I don't know what were the background or uh, what uh, made them uh, retract or take away, uh, vacate those areas. But uh, that definitely uh, added to our uh, uh, advantage as far as tactical and strategic importance is concerned. But as I said, I'm not aware what went behind the scenes uh, uh, before vacating it. But I'm sure that um, local commanders there, you know, the core commander and others, they know what they would do there are many other QPQ options. Should Chinese, uh, you know, PLA do anything of this nature again? So I'm sure that our commanders on ground would um, would have made out plans to negate such kind of a Chinese uh, PLA, you know, uh, uh, PLA's, uh, you know, uh, uh, initiatives. I I don't think Indian Army would uh, or Indian Army and Indian Air Force would allow PLA to take the initiative. But for that, it is a, we need far more surveillance uh, cap uh, cap capability, uh, no, no. Uh, far more intelligence inputs. So um, that is where I'm not very, very sure whether we have that matching uh, kind. Of, and then I'll also uh, like to put a word of caution here. Should something go wrong in these areas, I think we should not be, we should not get stuck on that, you know, in a political, uh, this thing that not an inch of ground will be given and things like that. You know, they, it doesn't happen in war. So uh, these uh, posturing, political posturing, internal, uh, uh, you know, divis divisive, political divisive uh, situation, this should not be uh, uh, allowed to come up during this kind of a national crisis, if uh, God forbid, uh, I, I don't think it should come, but the, if the, the borders are very secure, if we are secure internally, uh, that much, you know, and then uh, the enemy 
will like to take a full advantage of whatever is happening in India today in uh, in the in you know divisive polity and all kinds of you know what I'm referring to. So this is what I would like. Uh, in the end, I would say that tactically, I think we are reasonably prepared to face any kind of challenges. But in the strategic sense, uh, yes and no, because uh, yes in certain cases, but no uh, in many other, many dimensions. So I leave it at that. So these are the things that we should uh, do um, in, in a strategic sense and as well as in the tactical sense, we need to be aware what where we are lacking. Uh, that I, uh, uh, with that, uh, with that, I, uh, I close this, uh, my, my uh, answer. Uh, thank you, Nimale. Uh, yes, you, you know, I, I'm now um, reminded of the disengagement. Army headquarters put out 14 photographs, very rare ones and very well, you know, well focused of the disengagement process. And the, those photographs spoke for themselves. This brought out how, with what alacrity, the process of dising, you know, uh, withdrawal was being carried out. Dismantling. Dismantling means even leveling the bunkers. Everything was being done very efficiently one message that went there was they're in a hurry to get out. That was very clear to any of us, you know, um, soldiers who've been through um, all, a whole lot of exercises, um, even or battle, you know, or operational situations. Uh, that's fine, but you know. Um, if you have to re let's say reoccupy, we pro pro proved it that <laughs> this one of the most advantages of uh, you know high grounds, the Kailash Range with all its heights, that we can occupy it and occupy it very very effectively, and whatever attempts were made on uh, what what was that seventh September. 2020 in the night by a detachment of Chinese, they were advised, please go back. That, that's when they fired in the air. Those were the first bullets fired after 53 years since 19, uh, you know, 67. They fired in the air. Anyway, but uh, there's no doubt about the fact that we will need to uh, maintain our force levels, we'll have to make sure that, you know, whatever we need, we have in place. Um, Jaydeep, now I think we'll go for the last round. Um, um, anything else from your side? Uh, yes, sir. I, I'm neither a, a military mind like General uh, Consul Himalaya Singh, nor am I uh, endowed with the uh, mind of an intelligence uh, uh, a super intelligence officer of uh, Jaydev Radhe's uh, uh, stature. But, you know, I think when we talk about the Chinese game plan, this occurs to me only as a student of security, sir. I just want to put this forward uh, as a, a food for thought. Is that when we talk about the Chinese game plan, we should also try and ask ourselves what our game plan should be. One aspect which sort of bothered me during the Doklam crisis, for instance, is that they were trying to uh, construct a road all the way to the Zamferi Ridge so that they can have uh, a better look at the uh, chicken snack for the Siliguri Corridor to, uh, to monitor our troop movements. At that point of time, I stopped short of actually uh, writing an article, which I had started, but I was a uh, little uh, unwell. But the fact of the matter is I was wondering why did we not call the bluff and open up since we particularly have a friendly government in Bangladesh. Uh, by way of Sheikh Hasina's Awami League, why don't we open up access? We can still do that. Access from the Northeast all the way to uh, the Bay of Bengal. Uh, Mr. Anade, sir, uh, referred to uh, the Siliguri Corridor. Uh, and that is why I'm saying one of the uh, fears and the apprehensions that we are faced with is uh, that they would cut off the Siliguri Corridor. And the Doklam crisis 
probably uh, uh, gave us a, 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 you know, a kind of a reading of that. And during the 71 war, one of the greatest apprehension was there would be a pincer movement from then East Pakistan and China, and it would cut off the Northeast from the rest of the mainland. But the point is that as far as game plan is concerned, could perspective planning take into account that we should open up new accesses through Bangladesh all the way from Northeast? And I believe some work has been done by uh, Ambassador Pinak Ranjan Chakraborty of uh, a former envoy to Bangladesh. In fact, uh, but later on when I discussed, he said, Jaydeep, I have already written this paper. Maybe in, uh, in your uh, Sam talks, you could have him next, next time around. But uh, the, 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 the theory or paper, which I was basically talking about, that we should be able to call the Chinese bluff, not only about Siliguri Corridor, also about the psychological warfare, which you have referred to, but, you know, uh, the anti-gamut of uh, aspects which he's trying to threaten us with. In the East, I'm not a military man, as I said, but whatever little I am aware of, I think, you know, I think uh, our force levels are quite equipped. We have enough elements here to guard the border and the uh, grabbing of Tawang, as it were, with it better call, call, uh, boats, is not going to be uh, a walk uh, uh, in, in, in the yeah. dark for them. Now, we, I think I have visited myself the India-China boundary, almost the entire boundary in the Eastern sector. And I've seen for myself how well equipped and the most important thing which you yourself have pointed out and other speakers have said is the Josh, the, 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 uh, the absolute courage and ferocity with which our the, the soldiers no, no. fought last time and stood up to the dragon. And I'd never get tired of saying, sir, the dragon is a mythical animal of yesterday or something which we read about in fables and books. But the elephant which we epitomize in India, and particularly in Assam, I'm not talking pretty far away from Kaziranga, where the elephant's actually strolling, is a real and existing animal. And we can actually no, stand up no, to no, the dragon. No, no, dragon again actually, again there's, if you go on the internet, there is, a, there is a, a kind of a lizard, a very dirty lizard, which, which has been, you know, likened to the dragon. <laughs> Him. So, so anyway, we, we, we can stand up to it and we have stood up to it, sir. I mean, no, no. our Indian soldiers are uh, far more than a match to the uh, PLA soldiers. Without a doubt. Um, Jadev, any fi final closing thoughts on, uh, uh, on uh, particularly, you know, from your, uh, your perspective? I'll just, uh, since you said you want final closing thoughts by way of recommendations, uh, yes. we can make a long list, but let me just put three quick points here. Firstly, I quite agree with what I think uh, Mr. Saikya was trying to say, that we need to be proactive and not reactive. Even no, no. May, when, no, the, no. Uh, when we saw these massed troops, um, we did a tremendous job by bringing up our forces to block them. Uh, had there been a delay, I think we would have seen the Chinese forces come in. So uh, that was uh, a major move. But my question is, uh, from that, why did we have to go through this? When the Chinese went on the exercise, and as I explained earlier, when the relationship was already deteriorating rapidly, should we not have been alert? And should we not have anticipated that the Chinese would do something like this? So that is my first question that don't trust them, be vigilant, and suspect them all the time. There is no trust left now, in any case. I don't call it trust deficit, it's an absence of trust. Yes, absolutely. Second point, I think what we need in the intelligence services as well as the armed forces is a cadre of competent China analysts. People who study it, who understand it, who can get into the minds of the Chinese, and who are able to anticipate the next steps of the Chinese. I think that is important. Now, I've had long discussions on this with the army when they have called me, etc. But it requires some restructuring. In the army, I mean, both of you know, uh, I think within a year, year and a half, two years, people are posted out. And if the man doesn't go on the posting, he misses his promotion or whatever, or he has to go for an exam. You've got to have another cadre where you can assure the officers of a promotion up to a certain rank, but they are kept dedicated to watching China. 
wherever they may be. So I think one thing like that we have to build up. And then, of course, there is a pooling and all. I won't go into those details. And the third uh, and the final point, I think we have to change our mindset, whether it is in the diplom uh, diplomatic service or whether it is in the armed forces, in both. And I'm sorry to say that I find a lot of defensiveness, including in uh, the higher ranks of our armed forces. Uh, they're talking about how we can make up with the Chinese, how we can negotiate a border, to my mind. And I'm looking at it in a very simple way. That's not the jo job of the armed forces. Their job is to defend whatever borders exist. And let the others negotiate and stuff like that. But this is what I find the questions being asked to me at the defense training establishment, which brings me to the corollary that when things like this happen, I would expect our army commanders or our armed forces people to figure out ways of effective of effecting punitive punishment on the Chinese in another place. Maybe this is happening here, but somewhere else we can do something. Now that moment it happens, it means you're, as people will say, you're escalating the level. Well, so be it. But we have to factor these things. And I'm just throwing some ideas. Obviously, one has... No, no, you're very big. In fact, what this you, you, you touched on a very, you know, that this hesitation to raise the level, hesitation to raise the level. We've been saddled with that for seven decades. And we did it in, in, last year, I'll say only partially. We did it on the ground, but on the table. We did it on the terrain, but on the table again, we, you know, <laughs> frittered it away. So we, you, we certainly, there's no doubt about that. And um, the, this, this capabilities that we have, uh, you know, develop uh, capacities and capabilities capability we had capacity we developed there was there was equipment that we didn't uh, have which we've got but that's not all we need much more we need light tanks we certainly need about four to five regiments worth of light tanks which hopefully will come we need other equipment also which hopefully will come um, because we had a a very, very disastrous, uh, you know, <laughs> period of being, um, you know, being deprived of um, uh, replacements, new purchases for, um, um, you know, uh, more than a decade, till a few years ago. And um, um, there's absolutely no doubt about the kind of intelligence that we must develop. This is where organizations like the NTRO, National Technical uh, Research Organization, uh, we uh, we have, I mean we have a we have a fair cap capability ourselves. If we can make satellites for other countries to use, I think the, the, it's just a matter of uh, uh, a little bit of more technology or or, or I, I know there, there, there certainly has to be some political will also. So uh, I must thank you all gentlemen for some very important and significant uh, you know, inputs um, that we've been able to bring out. And um, um, let's look ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Anade. Thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Jadip Sakya. Thank, Thank you, you sir. Thank you, sir. I'm sure we'll meet again somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.